Um, if you guys have any questions, please post them now. And also, if you are um, hearing this and you can see sort of the video, um, let me know in the chat as well, just with a thumbs up. Blackboard's been a bit buggy today, so um, if we do have some freeze ups, uh, please let me know quickly and we can try and resolve it um, as quickly as possible. So if you can see sort of my hand waving and the start starting soon sign, let me know. Okay, great. Got one person. And I'll wait till I get a few people just so I can make sure everybody's on, on board. Okay. And, and like I said, um, try to keep track of, um, you know, the video. If it looks like it's bugging out or stopping, we stop me quickly, and that way you can resolve it sort of as quickly as possible. Um, all right, so remember this week we've got uh, two homework assignments that are due. There's section 2.4 and 2.5. Um, 2, 4 is complex numbers. That's what we're talking about today. And 2, 5 is quadratics. And uh, today we're mainly talking about complex numbers because it'll help us uh, tell the complete story about quadratics. So when we're looking for the solution to maybe where like the roots of a parabola are or an equation like ax squared plus bx plus c, then naturally what comes out of that are complex numbers um, in various forms. And that's because we'll end up taking square roots of negative numbers. Previously, we just said they, they weren't real numbers. And um, I'll sort of remind you about why they're not real numbers uh, today. They're something uh, completely different. Um, we've given the name imaginary numbers, but um, they are very practical and used in lots of areas of engineering um, and science and um, lots of cool stuff. So we'll talk a bit about um, complex numbers today and then quadratics on Friday. Um, and those two homework assignments are due the following Monday. Okay, and um, I should also say that um, your grades have been updated as well, so make sure that you're, you're checking out Blackboard and keeping track of your grade and that um, everything looks sort of like what your records um, would expect them to be. Okay, so just as usual, start every uh, class with the learning objectives. The learning objectives for today are pretty straightforward. However, we'll have lots of definitions that we'll need, um, and if you've never seen complex numbers before, um, we're going to kind of go through them, uh, you know, at a pace that's um, assuming that you've never seen them before, okay? Um, if you have seen them before, it'll be just sort of a good reminder, but it might be a little bit slower. Uh, but we'll have to um, describe what they are, where they come from, sort of what motivates them. And then we'll hit the learning objectives, and the learning objectives are similar to the types of things that you'll see in editing. So in your homework problems. Um, what you're going to see me put up on the board is what you would expect to uh, put in for your supporting work on your homework. And remember, your class notes at a minimum should include that. Um, several students didn't have that. Um, I gave full credit to everybody for their first class note submission. But um, make sure that you're looking at the feedback in case um, you need to make some changes, because next week you may not get um, full credit on the assignment. Um, Okay, so what are we going to talk about in terms of uh, supporting work? It's sort of what you're seeing on the board. So anything around the board would be fair game for sort of supporting work. But today we're going to focus on adding and subtracting complex numbers, um, and then multiplying and dividing. So add, subtract, and multiply are pretty straightforward. It's really similar to the way that you might multiply polynomials together. But um, dividing is a little more delicate. Um, we'll have to introduce the notion of a conjugate and um, how that plays a role in dividing complex numbers. So we'll do sort of maybe one example like that. And the best way to sort of understand the division thing is to just go through the algorithm a couple times. And the homework assignment will give you some good examples of um, that setup. And then finally, the last thing uh, that we'll talk about are the last couple of questions in infinity. There's like two or three at the end that talk about powers of um, I. And this will definitely come up for those of you that are planning to go on and take calculus courses um, when we start talking about um, power series and things like this in calculus, um, powers of I will be important in how to evaluate them. So this last um, objective is really important for those of you going on um, to algebra. Okay, so like usual, I'll leave those learning objectives up for a moment in case you were listening, so that you can write them down. And then if you have questions in the chat, you can post them there. This is a good time to maybe ask a question if um, there's something you want to ask. Okay. 
So um, again, there's going to be a lot of sort of definitions at first, so we'll wait probably um, quite a bit until we actually get to um, some questions or some examples that you'll see like in infinity and that are related to these objectives. There's sort of a lot of background definitions that we have to cover as well. Okay? Um, I'll try to point out what they're are the most important things. So if I highlight something, you should definitely um, write it down. But there are some things here that I'll just sort of show you that I don't expect you to maybe write in your notes. Okay, so um, just talking a bit about the motivation for complex numbers, what you're seeing here is what's called the Mandelbrot set. Um, and it lives in what's called the complex plane. Uh, so complex numbers live in a plane just like the coordinate plane in order pairs that we were talking about in section, I think, 2.1. Um, and the setup for that is uh, really similar. And uh, what you're seeing here is sort of a graph of a function who has complex numbers in it. And uh, the colors here represent sort of the different values of the function. And this uh, beautiful object is self-similar. So if you were to zoom in on it, it would sort of repeat itself. It's a really simple equation. It's just um, x squared plus c. Uh, there's some really cool videos online if you uh, get a chance to look at it. But um, you know, this has had contributions to arts and the sciences and things like this. So you'll see uh, these Mandelbrot sets all over museums and things like this. I'm talking about some of the details. Um, but they're also a really interesting aspect of mathematics as well. So people study this as um, a career as well. Uh, anyway, so that's the Mandelbrot set. We'll talk a bit about the complex plane again here in a moment. Um, let's take a step back and talk about um, what the imaginary number is. There's many imaginary numbers, but typically we talk about the imaginary number, i. Uh, it's the most important one, and it's sort of how we'll express all the other imaginary numbers, and also the complex numbers. Um, and it's defined by sort of two properties. Um, I'll call them here the two most important properties. You can take them as the definition or um, you can sort of derive them from first principles if you would like as well. But the first defining property is that i is taken to be the square root of negative 1. So previously we said that if we took the square root of a negative number, there was no real number. There was no answer. Um, but now we're going to add in an answer, right? And in this case, that answer, um, we'll call it i, and um, we'll sort of give it a name of the imaginary number. And because it's equal to the square root of negative 1, when we go through and square it, so if I take i and square it, then I get the same thing as the square root of negative 1 squared. So the square and the square root cancel each other out, and I'm left with negative 1. And this number is behaving um, much more differently than any real number we've ever seen, because if you take a positive number and you multiply it by itself, it's still going to be positive, because a positive times a positive is positive. And if you were to take a negative number and multiply it by itself, it would also be positive. So a negative times a negative would be positive. But here we have a new number such that when you multiply it by itself, remember i squared means i times i, you in fact get something that's negative. right? And that's why it's different from all of the real numbers that we had before, um, and we call it the imaginary number. Now, in terms of like sort of what you need to know about it, these are the two sort of properties, right? So these two properties here, um, will help you sort of solve any of the problems that you have in infinity, right? So they're the two most important properties. You could also take them sort of as the definition of that imaginary number i. Now, if I take the imaginary number i and I multiply it by a real number, like 2 or 3, I write it down like I would a polynomial, right? Like 2x or 3x. You, you treat i like a variable. And a uh, multiple of the imaginary number, like 5i, one of these things that I'm talking about, is called a purely imaginary number. And it turns out, that you can add purely imaginary numbers to real numbers, and you get um, complex numbers. Okay, so the idea of a complex number um, is that you have one number which is called the real part, and call that A, and a second number which you call the imaginary part um, B, and you've added them together. Okay. So you just form the sum a plus bi. And, and it doesn't get any simpler than that. That's um, as simple as it gets. There's a real part, the a, and there's an imaginary part, b. Um, if the b happens to turn out to be 0, we call it a real number, and we don't write the i at all. Uh, if the a is equal to 0, right, if that a over there is 0, we don't write the addition sign at all, and we say that it's a purely imaginary number. Um, but what you really need to know is a complex number is always of the form a plus bi. We can think about the i as being um, a variable, and there will always be a real part um, and an imaginary part. 
So a lot like an ordered pair, right? Like we had the ordered pair x, y, there were two components there. Here there's always two components, a and b. And um, I'm going to leave that up in case somebody has a question about it. Um, but again, remember the, the defining characteristic here is we're adding an imaginary number to a real number. We're getting something brand new called complex numbers. And um, there's sort of two components to it, the real and the imaginary. And because of that, we can think about them a lot of in the left of the same way that we did ordered pairs. So there's also a complex plane. Um, I'll be careful with just mentioning that the next stuff that we talk about, there's no questions in infinity and they're not part of the learning objective, um, but it'll give you a sort of a better understanding of what a complex number is, right, and how to view it. So real numbers were just on a single number line, right, just a horizontal number line. Um, and the complex numbers live in what's called the complex plane, okay? So it looks a lot like the same sort of xy plane that we were talking about in section 2.2. But now, um, instead of the x-axis, we've got what's called the real axis, and that's why it's called R there. And instead of the y-axis, we've got what's called the imaginary axis, and that's going vertical, right? So the real numbers are sitting across here uh, on this axis. The purely imaginary numbers are sitting vertically along this vertical axis. And the complex numbers like negative 2 plus 3i um, occupy the various other quadrants um, that we have for complex numbers. And the way that we associate a complex number to a point is very similar to what we did back with ordered pairs. We start with the real part, and the real part tells us sort of where we go along the real axis, and then we look at the imaginary part, that's the part next to the i, and that tells us where to go along um, the imaginary axis. So here the negative 2 just means go two units to the left, and the positive 3i means go three units up. And so we get to this point here uh, that we see there. And every complex number that you can write down is associated to one unique point in the complex plane and vice versa, right? So there's sort of a natural correspondence between the two of them. And so anytime that you want to write down a complex number, you have to figure out the A and the B, what's the real part and the imaginary part. And if you do that, you can, you know, determine exactly where it is on this plane. Okay, but I should again say that there's no questions like this on the homework. It's just something that comes up in the book and you should be aware of, especially if you're going to go on to calculus. But that's the complex plane. And uh, here I put the how-to, but I wouldn't even say, don't write this into your notes. Let me just uh, point out that it's saying exactly what I just mentioned before. If you take a complex number and you'd like to sort of graph it in the complex plane, then you first determine the real part, that's the A, the imaginary part, that's the B. You move along the horizontal or the x-axis by the real part. You move along the vertical axis by the imaginary part, and then you just plot the point. And that's exactly what we did here, right? So we went negative 2, that's the real part, up 3, that's the imaginary part, and we got to the point. Okay, so that's the how-to on this guy. I wouldn't even write it down. There's no homework problems on it, and it's not really part of our objective. But it will help you understand that there's a geometric aspect to these complex numbers as well. You should think about them not as being a number line, but an entire plane, okay? And some really cool stuff happens, right? Like that Mandelbrot set. So um, even for really simple stuff. Okay, so that's the how-to there, um, but here's the how-to that you should probably write down the details of, um, and it's a little bit overkill, but we're going to write it as a how-to, and then we'll uh, mention how we'll use it um, in our example. Uh, and this how-to is how to subtract, add or subtract complex numbers. And when you're adding or subtracting complex numbers, you really should just treat i like a variable, like you would for any old polynomial, and then you just um, add the real parts and the imaginary parts. Okay, and that's what this, this how-to says. If you are given two complex numbers and you'd like to find the sum or the difference, so sum means add, difference means subtract, um, all you do is identify the real and imaginary parts, the A and the B of each of them, and you add or subtract the real part, and then you add or subtract the imaginary part. And it's exactly the same thing as collecting like terms. Like when you're adding polynomials, you collect the pieces that have i's and the pieces that don't have i's. So you treat that i like a variable, and that's how you add and subtract. And instead of doing an example at this point, let me go on and talk about some of the harder uh, sort of pieces here, multiplication and division. And then once we talk about those two things, we'll come back and do several examples of the process. Okay. So multiplication. Um, when you're going to multiply two complex numbers, it looks something like this. Let me just put an example up on the board. So you might end up doing something like 3 plus 2i. That's a complex number. And let's say you wanted to multiply it by something like 5 plus 7i, okay? 
And the first thing that should sort of jump out at you is that this looks a lot like um, if we were just multiplying two polynomials together. And in fact, that's the first step that you should do. You should just use the FOIL method. Remember, FOIL here stands for first, outer, inner, last. Um, that's what this FOIL method is telling us. So you want to use that uh, FOIL method to just multiply this whole expression out, treating the i like it's a variable. But that's not quite the, the last step. i really is not a variable. It's, in fact, the imaginary number. So the only other property that you'll need is to use this here, that i squared um, was equal to negative 1. And that just comes from the definition. i was equal to the square root of negative 1, so i squared has to be negative 1. And you'll replace all of the i squareds with negative 1 and then simplify. And once you simplify, um, you'll be able to group, to ter uh, group together the real term and the imaginary term, and it'll be of the form a plus bi. And the real goal there is to write it in a form where it's something that you could plot on that um, complex plane, right? If you know the a, you know the b, you could plot it. So that's what we're after with um, a solution. Now. For example, this, this multiplication that I'm writing down here, I don't know where that is in the complex plane just by looking at it, but if I multiplied it out, I could figure out exactly where it would um, be located. So just treat them like polynomials, and the only extra business that you need is that i squared is negative 1. Okay, so multiplication, addition, and subtraction are really not much different than, um, you know, dealing with polynomials and adding and subtracting and multiplying those, with the exception that i squared is equal to negative 1. Okay, but what's more difficult is if you're trying to do division, okay? So, for example, you may be interested in dividing something like 3 plus 2i by 7 minus i because it might show up in your identity homework. Um, and this is the last of the learning objectives, right? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and now division. And the trick with division um, is that you need to make sure that the denominator doesn't have any i's in it at all. And there's a really nice way to do this. Um, it's called uh, the conjugate or multiplying by the conjugate. And what you'll end up doing is you'll replace this, um, or not replace it, but you'll take this denominator here and um, write down what's called the conjugate. And we'll talk more in detail when we do an example, but the conjugate just replaces the uh, imaginary part with its negative. So here, the conjugate would be 7 plus i. And if I divide by something, if I want to keep it the same, I should multiply by it. Right, so that they undo one another. And if I do that, you'll notice that this is a difference of squares down here. Okay? And so the denominator will end up being just a real number. There won't be any i's in it. And that's going to be really important in order to, to find your answer. But let me talk about that in a little more detail here and give you some terminology. Right? So the terminology is the following. The complex conjugate of a complex number a plus bi. So you give me the complex number a plus bi. Its conjugate just means take the uh, term that's next to the i and replace it with its negative. So boom, a minus bi. And um, so that second sentence there is just it's changing the imaginary part to its negative. Okay. And um, the key feature here of complex conjugates is that when you multiply um, for example, a plus bi times a minus bi, uh, then you'll end up with, and we'll show this later on, just a squared plus b squared um, because of the difference of squares, okay? So this fact here is telling us that we can get rid of the i's altogether in the denominator, and we'll use that sort of later on, okay? So that's the complex conjugate, and let me just summarize how the division will work. So to do this, to divide two complex numbers, um, you write the division problem as a fraction. Typically, it'll be given to you in fraction form, but you want to start out by writing it as a fraction like we did um, with that previous one. You'll determine the complex conjugate of the denominator. That's the bottom of the fraction. And then you'll multiply the numerator and denominator by that um, complex conjugate and simplify. And when we do the example, you'll see um, what happens in the simplification process. And you'll have a couple of these in infinity yourself to try out. And so as you do a couple of examples, you'll see sort of the steps are pretty similar for each one. But we'll need that complex conjugate. Okay, so before I get into powers of i, let me actually take a step back and, and really do some examples, right? And these are the kind of examples that you're going to see um, in your homework in infinity. And these are the ones that are related to those learning objectives. Okay, 
Um, the first one is just a sum. So let's go all the way back to an example where we're doing the sum. In this case, I'm going to add 4 minus 5i. That's a complex number. And I'm going to add it to negative 2 plus 2i. Okay? So uh, those of you following along, um, try this out, right? See if you can follow that algorithm that you're mentioning. Um, treat the i like a variable. And once you have an answer, um, post it in the, uh, the chat, and we'll go from there. Okay, I see Alejandro's got one, two minus three i. There's got two minus three i. Okay, so, so yeah, I'm going to follow the algorithm really closely, but you could have just jumped right to the 2 minus 3i if you're just collecting like terms, right? So let me try and um, sort of go through that algorithm that, that um, I put up on the board a moment ago. And what it said was identify the real parts first. So the real part of this guy is the 4, and the real part of this complex number is the negative 2. It's the stuff not next to the i. Um, and here we're doing an addition, so we just take those two things and we add them together. So here we get 4 plus, and I'm going to put in parentheses negative 2. So you can see that I'm adding 4 and negative 2. Right? I mean, I could have written that as 4 minus 2, but I'm going to write it in as 4 plus negative 2. And then the algorithm said, okay, then identify the uh, imaginary parts. So that's the number that's next to the i, right? So here it's 2. Now this one is negative 5. So we would put negative 5, and we're adding them together. So negative 5 plus the 2. And then here, because it's the imaginary part, we put an i on the outside. And you could just think about this as i being a variable, right? But this is what they said in the, the algorithm, right? And again, this is a negative. You can see that on there. That's a negative 5 because of the minus 5 i. Okay, and then just sort of following through with what people have said, we have 4 minus 2, which is 2. Um, and then over here, we've got negative 5 plus 2, which is negative 3. So I'll write that as minus 3 i. And so now we can see that it's 2 minus 3i. And we know exactly where it is on the complex plane now, right? So we would go two units to the right and then three units down. And so when you're trying to find your answer for a complex number, that's, that's the key. If you know where it is on the plane, then you know exactly what the answer is. Um, up here, we didn't quite know where it was, right? But once we simplify it, okay, you know where it is. Okay, so that's addition. Um, let's do some subtraction now as well. Uh, just so we can see that process as well. And it's just as simple. In this case, we're going to do 12 minus 2i. And I'm going to subtract from it 2 plus 4i. And again, I'll give everybody a moment to um, write out their solution. And I'm going to subtract. Sorry, I did addition here on, on the board. But I want to do an example of subtraction. So once you have um, this subtraction, um, chime in on the board in the chat. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so everybody's um, here on the 10 minus 6i. We see a 2i. Um, let's go through and um, be careful about what to do with that negative sum. Okay, so here I'm going to identify the real parts first. This one's 12. This one's 2. And just like up here, I'll take 12, and then I'll do whatever the um, operation here is. It's subtraction. So 12 minus 2. So 12 minus 2. That's where everybody's getting the 10 from. And I'll put a plus sign, and then in parentheses here, I'm going to do the imaginary part, which is negative 2 of this one, and the imaginary part here, which is 4. So this is negative 2, and this one's 4. So we'll get a negative 2, but then we're subtracting 4. And then remember, this is the imaginary part, so we put an i there. That's just following the algorithm, right? You subtract the real part uh, from the real part and the imaginary part from the imaginary part. Okay, and then um, subtracting these together, um, I think we get what everybody said here, 10 uh, minus 6i, right? So minus 2 minus 4 is minus 6i. And now we know exactly where it is in the complex plane, right? Um, we go along the real axis 10 units. And then down the imaginary axis, 6 units. So we go down, okay? So that's 10 minus um, 6i. And you don't have to factor the 2 out here. Um, we want to really write it as a plus bi, 
right? So when we're looking for the complex number, we want to know precisely what the real part is and what the imaginary part is. So we don't want to factor any of the twos out or anything like that. Although that's that's the same, and I think um, Affinity would probably give you full credit um, for something like that. Okay, so that is um, addition and subtraction. And notice we haven't really used any of the properties of the imaginary number. We just treated i um, like it was a variable. And so I would be fine on an exam if you jump directly from here to here or from here to here. This step that I'm writing out is just to help you see how that algorithm is used um, to add and subtract. Okay, so now let's start talking about multiplication. And the first problem that I'm going to do is going to sort of throw a wrench into the how-to that we posted because remember the how-to said use the FOIL method, but there are some tricky questions on infinity that um, you're not going to use the FOIL method. You're instead going to use um, what's called the distributive law. So let's see an example of that. Let's say you wanted to take um, 4 minus 5i, this is question 3, and you wanted to multiply it by the complex number 7i. This is a purely imaginary number because we can really think about this number as 0 plus 7i. So the real part of this 7i number is 0, um, but uh, when we think about it in this form, we're not going to really use the FOIL method like they said before. Instead, what we'll do is just multiply this out, use the distributive law, and then simplify as much as possible. So those of you sort of following along, the distributive law, you take the 7i and you'd multiply by the 4 first. So what's the first term we should get? What happens when we take that 7i and we multiply it by the 4? Okay, so we get 28i. And I'm going to put it on this side over here, okay? So the 7 times the 4 is 28, and then we get that i. Um, and then we take the 7i and we multiply it to the negative 5i. So what do we get for that second term when we multiply the negative 5i times the 7i? Yeah, so 7 times 5, uh, 7 times negative 5 is negative 35, and then there's two i, so it's i squared. And so far we're just treating it the way that we would for a variable. But now you'll see that we still can't figure out where it is in the complex plane because we have that i squared. Um, but we should know that i squared is just equal to negative 1. So here, this is 28i minus 35 times negative 1, right? Now, I could have written just plus 35, but I want to write like negative 1 here because I want to make it explicit that what I'm doing is replacing i squared with negative 1. Um, and when you do that, you get 28i plus 35. And you could have jumped straight from here to here, right, if you'd like. Now, usually we write the real number first and the imaginary number second, and you might want to be careful in infinity if it's asking for the real or imaginary parts and sort of what it's looking for. But here we would put the 35 first, usually, and then the 28 um, after. And you'll notice that we know now where this point is in the complex plane because we go 35 units to the right and then 28 units Okay, whereas up here, we wouldn't have known exactly where it was. So that's what you're looking for when you're trying to find um, an answer in one of these cases. And I just wanted to point out that this one's a bit different because what you're doing is using the distributed law to distribute the set and out. You're not actually using the first, outer, inner, last, um, like it says in that algorithm. So be a bit careful when you're just multiplying by a purely imaginary number. So the 7i is what we called an imaginary number, not necessarily um, complex. Well, it is complex, but it's also an image. Okay, so let's now do one that um, follows the algorithm very carefully uh, because it's both, you know, completely complex numbers. So in this case, I'm going to do 2 plus i and 3 minus 2i. This is number four. We've got two plus i and um, three minus two i. And um, what I'd like you guys to do in the chat is not not sort of get to the answer and then post your answer, but instead let's first go through the FOIL method here, right? And remember the FOIL is that first, outer, inner, last. Um, and in the chat, when you're done with that process of first, outer, inner, last, let's write the four terms that should go here. 
Um, and we won't replace I squared with negative 1 just yet. We'll leave the I squared in there. So just like you would if you were multiplying things out. And then as soon as somebody has it, we'll, we'll go from there. I just want to give everybody enough time to write things down and think about the questions. Okay. So it looks like a couple of people have thrown it in. Yeah, Alejandro, I think I, I know what you mean by it. It's not 32. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Okay, um, and I'll let one more person chime in because there's been a couple different answers here and we'll see if, um, okay, you should, Jordan. All right, great guys. It looks like you're sort of uh, almost on the right track here. We've got an extra I squared, I think, in that one. So let's, let's go through this carefully, okay? So remember, when you're foiling things out, you do the first two terms first. So the first is going to be 2 times 3. That's 6. Okay. So that's the first two. Then there's the outer two terms. In this case, that's the 2 and the negative 2i. So 2 times negative 2 is minus 4, but there's only one i. Right? So it's not that i squared that was uh, in the chat there. It's just the i. Um, so that's the first outer. And then in the FOIL method, the next is inner. Um, so you do i times 3. That's just going to give you 3i. And then finally, you do the last. That's these two terms here, the i and the negative 2i. So it's minus 2i squared. And if you wanted to write that as plus 2 right away, you certainly could, right? Because we should all recognize now that i squared is going to be negative 1. Okay? But here, this is what we get from that FOIL method. So this is step one. Use the FOIL method to multiply it out. Um, step two is now to simplify things. So here, we're going to get 6. And then um, this is an i and this is an i. So minus 4 plus 3. So that's just um, a minus i. And then um, here, this is minus 2. And I'm going to replace the i squared with negative 1. If you see that it's just plus 2, you can write plus 2. But I'm trying to make it clear to everybody that we have that... Uh, minus 1, okay? So here is the i squared becoming negative 1. That's our key feature of um, complex numbers. And uh, a negative times a negative is a positive. So this is 6 minus i plus 2. And then here we just want to collect the terms together, right? So the things without i's, there's a 6 and a 2. 6 plus 2 is 8. And then there's only one thing with an i, it's that minus i. So this is minus i. And we can box our answer here. And we know that this is the answer because we've identified both the real and the imaginary part of the answer. And we know exactly where it is on the complex plane. Eight units to the right, one unit down. Right? Up here, we didn't quite know that. And that's what we were after down here with the 8 minus i. OK, so multiplication using that FOIL method. It's just FOIL it, replace the i squared with negative 1, and um, collect the terms together. And you've got the right answer. Okay, so I want to do one more example of multiplication before we move on to division, which, like I said, is the hardest of the sort of four things that we're covering, or operations that we're covering today. And um, I want to do it because at Trinity will ask things in sort of a funky way, but just realize that it's actually another way of asking a multiplication question. So our four um, objectives, if you remember, are um, how to add and subtract and how to multiply and divide. But infinity will ask you a question, in some cases, like the following. 1 plus 2i squared. OK? And um, 1 plus 2i squared looks like it's um, an exponent, right? So they're asking you to do you know, complex exponentiation. But in this case, you just have to remember that squaring something is the same thing as multiplying it by itself. OK? So be a bit careful in infinity. They're going to ask you about some exponents here, but just remember all you're going to do with exponents is multiply the thing by itself. Okay, so let's go through this again. Here's the first. 1 times 1 is 1. Um, here is the outer. 1 times 2i is just 2i. Uh, the inner is 2i times 1, so another 2i. And then finally, the outer is 2i times 2i. Um, and what is 2i times 2i? What should go um, next over here? 2i times 2i. 
um, 4i squared, right? So 2 times 2 is 4, and then we get the i squared. But if you wanted to, you could have just put minus 4 there, right? Because that's going to be sort of our next step. You get 1 plus 4i plus 4i squared. Here I'm just adding the 2i and the 2i to get 4i. But then remember, i squared is equal to um, negative 1. So this is plus 4 times negative 1. And again, I'm, I'm putting it at like times negative 1, but you could have written just minus 4 if you see that. But I just want to show you here that what I'm doing is replacing the i squared with negative 1. Okay, so then we get 1 plus 4i minus 4. Okay, so what's our answer here when we collect all the uh, like terms? Yeah, so negative 3 plus 4i. Um, which of the quadrants are we in? 1, 2, 3, or 4 during the complex thing? That's a good question. Majority says quadrant 2. Who agrees? Who disagrees? Quadrant 2, Melissa. Okay, yeah, quadrant 2. The reason why is that we go to the left by the real number, that's negative, and then up by 4. Boom, we're over there in the second quadrant. Okay? Remember, it goes counterclockwise as we go around. Um, they're not going to ask you about quadrants or anything in this homework assignment, but just to tie back to what we were talking about before. Okay, so um, that's it for addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Um, be careful, they'll ask it uh, in sort of funky ways as well. And um, now what I want to talk about um, is division. So let's just go jump right into an example of a division problem. And uh, remember that first step in the algorithm was to write it as a fraction. So if there's like a division symbol, you should write it as a fraction. I'm just going to write it as a fraction sort of right away. And the one that we're going to look at here in our example is 4 plus i divided by 2 minus i. Okay? And um, here I've already written in fractional form. Right? So what they mean in that first step is if there was like one of these symbols somewhere, rewrite it as a, as a fraction. Okay, so then the next thing that we said was that we wanted to clear out the denominators so that the denominator didn't have any i's in it. Um, and the method that we were going to use uh, was to multiply by the conjugate of whatever the, is in the denominator. So remember the conjugate just means take the imaginary part and replace it with its negative. So what is the conjugate of the denominator in this case? Okay. So, so yeah, we would just replace the i with its negative. So here the conjugate would be 2 plus i. And remember, if we're going to divide by something, we've got to multiply by it in order to cancel it out. So multiplying by 2i and then dividing by 2i doesn't change anything at all. What it's going to change for us is the form of the denominator. Okay. Um, just as a quick check about conjugates, what's the conjugate of 4 plus i? What would be the conjugate of this one? 4 minus i. Yeah, yeah. so again, we just replaced the i. What about 2 plus i? What's the conjugate of 2 plus i? 2 minus i. Yeah, yeah, so you just swap out. If it's positive, it's negative. If it's negative, it's positive, okay? So now um, what we're going to do is just multiply this out, okay? So the way that we would with a rational expression, we multiply the top by the top, bottom by the bottom. So 4 plus i times 2 plus i on the top, and then on the bottom, 2 minus i times 2 plus i. And we picked this in just the right way so that these two um, will get rid of all of the i's, right? So that's the, the key with the conjugate. Um, but let's just do the FOIL method, right? I mean, maybe you don't see that this, this is actually the difference of squares, so you could immediately just jump to the fact that it's 5, if you can see that. If you don't see that it's 5 immediately, then you can just do the FOIL method and FOIL everything out, and we'll end up seeing that um, the denominator there when we multiply it out gives us a 5. Okay. So I'm going to leave the top for a moment, and we'll foil out the denominator. Okay, so the first times the first, that's 4. Uh, the outer is 2 times i. And then the inner is negative i times 2, so that's minus 2i. And that's why the i's are going to disappear. 
That's that key feature of picking the conjugate, right? So one of the i's be positive, the other one be negative, with the same coefficients, so they'll cancel each other out. And then the last part is uh, negative i times i, so that's minus i squared. So that's just foiling out the denominator. And before I simplify it, I'm also going to foil out the numerator, okay? So let's foil out this uh, numerator up here. It's going to be 4 times 2. That's 8. That's the first. Uh, then the outer will be plus 4i. Uh, the inner will be plus 2i. And then the last is plus i squared, i times i. Okay, so just first, outer, inner, last. Now you can go through and simplify these. So these are all equal to each other, right? Now we can go through and simplify these as much as we can. Um, and we'll use the fact that i squared is equal to negative 1. Oh, sorry. Well, then we're, the, are you talking about all the numbers or the numerator or the denominator, the top or the bottom? Yeah, so the, so the 2i came from the conjugate, and then here we just multiplied the top and bottom by 2i, so nothing changes. So this is what we started with. Um, top by the top, bottom by the bottom, and now we're just foiling out. So first, outer, inner, last. And I'll walk through it one more time on the bottom. It's first times the first, 4. Um, the outer is this term here times this term there. That's the 2i. The inner two terms are negative i and 2. That's the minus 2i. And the last term is the negative i times the i. So that gives us a negative i squared. Negative times a positive is negative. And then you do the same thing on the top, right? So it's just foiling out the whole thing. So that's where that uh, bottom piece comes from. And now we're going to sort of simplify things by collecting terms and replacing the i squared with negative 1. So up here we'll have an 8. Uh, here's a 4i and a 2i, so that's 6i. Uh, and then i squared is minus 1. Uh, and then down here on the bottom, this one cancels with this one. That was the goal of the conjugate. All of the i's disappear. And now we have 4 minus i squared. Remember, i squared is negative 1, so this is 4 plus 1. Right? i squared is negative 1. Negative, negative makes it positive. Um, here, 8 minus um, 1 is 7. Um, we have that 6i, and it's all divided by 5. Okay, but um, this isn't quite exactly the way that we want to express the answer. Uh, remember, we want to know what the real and the imaginary parts of our complex number are, so let me go ahead and do that up here. I'll write this as 7 over 5 plus 6 over 5 times i. Just separating it, and now we know the real part is 7 fifths, and the imaginary part is 6 fifths. Okay, and this sort of thing is going to happen every time you do a division. The bottom is going to turn into just a real number without the i's, and then the top you'll simplify, okay? You'll end up with some fractions like this. Um, Ali, they're exactly the same here, but sometimes in infinity they'll want you to identify the real part and the imaginary part. So in this case, the real part is 7 over 5, and the imaginary part is 6 over 5. And you could use that to then graph the points on the coordinate plane. But, but really, it's not um, important, right? Like on an exam, I would give you full credit for writing it this way. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, they should both be accept, uh, accepted by affinity, too. But I would just be a bit careful. If it doesn't accept your answer, just send me a message, and maybe we can sort of look at the details of what affinity is really asking for. But be careful about what it's asking for. Is it asking for the complex number? Is it asking for the real part? Is it asking for the imaginary part? Just read the instructions, I guess, is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, so that's um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Division being the hardest of those four. And now the last part that we want to talk about, um, like I said, are like the last three problems in the uh, homework assignment, and they're about powers of i. And this is particularly important for you students that are going on to calculus, but that's that last learning objective that you're seeing over here, right? Oops. Simplify powers of i. And there are, I, I think, two or three examples like this on 
um, Xfinity. So let me, um, instead of putting up that big giant chart that you just saw flash by you, I'm going to sort of derive pieces of it first, and then I'll show you that the powers of I are cyclic. Okay. So let's start out with I and um, raise it to the power of one. So I to the power of one is just I. Um, what about I squared? What do we get for I? Um, negative one. Right? So we said I squared was negative one. Now what I want to do is start talking about the other powers of I. So let's look for a pattern here. So I to the power of three. Um, remember, I to the power of three is I times I times I. In other words, it's I squared times I. Okay? And I squared times I, well, I squared was negative one. So this is just negative I. Okay? Let me move that learning objective for you. Um, so that's going to be negative I. Okay? Let's talk about I to the fourth. And this is where sort of um, something neat happens. If we look at I to the fourth, it's going to be I to the power of three times an extra I. So it's whatever this was times an extra I. So that's going to be negative I times I. But I times I is I squared. So this is negative I squared, which is just equal to one. So if I take I and I raise it to the power of four, then I get one, okay? And actually, this is true for any power of four at all, right, or any multiple of four. If I take something like 40, I to the power of 40, then I can rewrite this as I to the power of four times 10, right, because 40 is just four times 10. And then I can use um, properties of an exponent. This is I to the fourth, um, then raised to the power of 10. And we just saw that I to the fourth was one, so this is uh, 1 raised to the power of 10, 1 raised to the power of 10 is 1. And what I'm trying to point out to you is that if you take i to the power of any multiple of 4, right, any multiple of 4, so 8, 16, and so on and so forth, any multiple of 4 here, like 40, um, then you're always going to get 1. And it's because of this, right, because of this and the properties of exponents. Okay, but there's a little bit more to it than just powers of four getting you back to a one. There's also um, more of a pattern here as well. So what you're seeing here on uh, the screen now is what we did just a moment ago, right? So these four here, sorry, these four um, here are what we just did on the board. And we saw that we went basically in this pattern, I, negative one, negative I, and then back to one. And if we were to then multiply by i again, 1 times i would give us back i. So i to the power of 5 is i. And then if I multiply that 1 times i, I'm going to jump back to this pattern that I had here. So negative 1. And then if I multiply by i again, I get to negative i. And then uh, here, I'll multiply by i again and get to 1. But notice that's what we should have expected because 8 is a multiple of 4. So any multiple of 4, if we raise i to the power of that, we just get back 1. And then the pattern continues, OK? So what's the pattern? It's i, negative 1, negative i, and 1. And it works uh, for powers of 4, OK? So um, anytime it's a power of 4, you can sort of figure it out. But there's uh, also a method here for figuring it out for any value. And to do it, we'll have to remember how to compute the remainder of a number. So let me give you two examples. And then I'll go through it and show you how that works. And then we'll be done for the day. Okay, so the two examples we're going to work on um, are the following. We're going to do i to the power of 52, and then we'll also talk about i to the power of 35. Okay? And the way that you'll do this is to actually take this number, whatever the exponent is, and divide it by 4. So both of these, let me start the process off of sort of this long division back from elementary school. So go through the process of getting those together and figuring out what the remainder is. Um, I know that we're sort of getting to the end of class, so if you want to just um, head on out and then watch the recording of this um, later on, this may take about a minute or two if you need to get to another class. 
I apologize. But if you want to stick around, go through and find um, this process of how many times does 4 go into 35, how many times does 4 go into 52. Okay, and if you figure out this first one, let me know. What should go on the top of here? Okay, so you guys are saying um, 13. Let's go through the process. Remember what you do is you say, oh, hey, here's my five. How many times does four go into five? It's one. Okay, one times four, that gives us four. Then we subtract the four from the five to get one. We bring down the two. And then we say, okay, now we do the whole process again. How many times does four go into 12? And then we say, aha, it's exactly three. Okay, and then we subtract and we get zero. And we get a remainder of zero. Um, and what this means is that 52 is a multiple of 4, right? So 52 um, is just 4 times 13. So up here, this is just i to the 4 times 13. And we could do the same trick we did before. It's just i to the 4th all raised to the power of 13. i to the 4th is just 1. 1 to the 13th is just 1. And we could have just jumped right to 1 because we're now seeing that 52 is a multiple of 4. So if you, if you divide and you find a remainder of zero, then the power is going to be one. Okay? So uh, that's what we get for this one. However, in some cases, you may not get a remainder of zero. And we'd still like to figure out where this is in the complex plane. Like, where is i to the 35 in the complex plane? So here you'll go through and you'll say, ah, it doesn't go into uh, three at all. So then you ask yourself, how many times does four go into 35? And I think I saw some people put it in the chat there, but how many times does um, 4 go into 35? Okay, yeah, 8. And 4 times 8, that's the um, uh, value of 32. So it's not exactly equal to that 35. So what's the remainder in this case? What do we get for our remainder? A remainder of 3. Okay. And um, what that means is that this is not equal to 1, right? Because the only way it's equal to 1 is if it's a multiple of 4. But we can sort of figure out um, from this uh, information what's going on. Because what this equation really means is that 35 is not quite equal to 4 times 8, right? So 4 times 8 is this 32. Um, it's equal to 4 times 8, but we have to add on 3 more. Right? So that's what a remainder of 3 is. Right? It's almost divisible uh, by 4. You get 8, but there's still 3 more left over. And we can use that fact to figure out what this is. So i to the 35 is equal to i to the 4 times 8 plus 3. And um, let's rewrite this as i to the 4 times 8 times i to the power of 3. And this one is just a multiple of 4. So this is just 1. Right? For the same reason as this, right? It's just a multiple of 4. So this is just um, 32, so it's just going to be 1. And so we get i cubed um, as our answer there. Sorry, guys, you can't see that. Let me jump to the full board. Um, yeah, so here we've got i to the 48, or not, not 48, 4 times 8, but that's a multiple of 4, so it's just 1. And then i cubed. So it's just going to be equal to i cubed. And um, as we saw back in that chart, i cubed was just equal to negative 1. Let me go back and remind you of i cubed here in this picture. So here was our uh, i cubed was equal to negative i. And again, we can find negative i on the complex plane. It's just one unit down along the vertical axis. Okay, so that's how you do it. You just look at the remainder. Um, it's really just going to be equal to the power of the remainder. So that's an easier way to do this problem. You just say take 35 divided by 4, you get a remainder of 3, and you say, ah, it's equal to i to the power of 3. This one, you got a remainder of 0, you say, ah, it was equal to i to the power of 0, i to the power of 0 is 1. So it's just equal to whatever that remainder is, um, is what you get for the powers, okay? So I'm going to stop the recording here. It's already three minutes over. Um, I'll be around for the next couple of minutes if you have a question or two to ask. Thanks for being here.